welcome everyone here um, and a very good morning to all of you for the Corporate Innovation Summit. Um, so the Corporate Innovation Summit is really a, uh, our platform to help corporates who particularly as businesses grow and they expand, um, they need to grow um, inclusively and they need to grow exclusively. So therefore, how that growth is going to be achieved is something that we are going to talk about over the next one hour. Uh, so we have a panel of great experts over here who come from various corporates and they're working uh, intrinsically to make sure that uh, you know, their organizations, no matter how large their size, they are still growing and they are still becoming bigger and better um, with their work. So um, I'm going to start touching upon with the first topic, which is probably one of the most uh, important area of concern at any point of time to any corporate, which is growth and innovation. Um, so today, how that innovation will happen? You know, what part of the innovation should happen within the organization and what part of the innovation has to be um, uh, is cultivated within the company and what part has to be incorporated from outside. So with that thought in mind, I'm going to first cast Mr. Aman Goel, who's the managing director of PwC, and he's here with us today morning. Um, you know, sir, I know that you've been working with the uh, corporates at PwC all across. So how do you ensure that, and you know, I'm sure this is one thing that they come to you uh, to make sure that how they are able to bring that innovation and that change that is really required for their organization to happen for them to grow. So how is PwC and yourself, you're working to make sure that that growth and innovation comes. And also if you can touch upon where does this growth stop for a corporate and therefore how they should re-engineer their growth back into the system. So thanks a lot for uh, for introducing us and, and it's a fantastic topic. I think uh, very timely, very apt topic. Um, if you look at growth, um, it's, it's normally said that growth in any organization brings complexity. So when you are taking leaps, whether it is a leap of scaling up from a startup to a large enterprise or it is a, a wave of technology which has disrupted your organization or ecosystem, uh, growth and innovation kind of starts becoming intertwined. Growth everybody hunts for, but innovation is what keeps the business alive, that keeps the business going and uh, sort of uh, 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 in a sense that keeps the business charged up. Now, uh, some things that need to be thought about is that you could not separate, you cannot separate these things uh, uh, from each other. If you just follow the pursuit of growth without focusing on innovation, sooner or later, there are intrinsic external factors that catch up to an organization. You could have competitors who are starting up from a different industry and they can start to disrupt your business. And we have heard stories and stories of how different non-traditional startups have kind of come in. They have kind of taken the businesses and, and they, they are sort of forced to reckon with. There is a second big factor of customer expectation. Um, uh, what, what becomes good today does not become does not remain good from a customer expectation tomorrow. So how do you keep that in mind? And then there are these big pushes of technological innovations, maybe AI, maybe quantum, maybe all of this edge computing, all of these things which keeps the business on the toes. And it is absolutely essential that the CEO mindset, the CXO mindset kind of looks at those two things. Culture of innovation and culture of growth has to be a boardroom agenda. It cannot be an agenda which is driven only, uh, let's say, at a mid-management level. You would find across the organization that people who are very, very entrepreneurial in nature, they are very, very ready to come up with ideas. But if there is not an enabling culture within the organization who promotes that, there are, there are, then you are letting go of the opportunity that exists within your organization. You would always find there is somebody in your warehouse, there is somebody who is in your accounts payable shop, somebody in your supply chain who is always ready with new ideas. Uh, if you look at Japanese model and a traditional model of manufacturing uh, your Lean Six Sigma, there they always say that come up with small innovations. But today, if we do not tap into our new generation's thinking, how can the disruptive effect can come into it? That that sort of is a opportunity wasted. In order to be able to capitalize on it, I think there is a need of diversity. Diversity in form of thought, diversity in form of perspective, and diversity in form of horizon thinking as well. When I say horizon thinking, you would have uh, different organization, different age groups which are living in your organization. There will be some people who are very, very young, out of college, who are very tech savvy, who think two years only. There are people in the organization who are very stable in the way they think and they operate. Their horizon is probably 10 years, 15 years. And there are a set of people who are in between. Unless you tap into different energies, unless you bring in all of that together, you marry that with a different kind of thought. So 
female representation diversified ethnic representation then the growth and innovation kind of still remains skewed so i think in a sense it is how do you kind of balance these factors together that keeps the innovation you need to partner with internal and external ecosystem as well because if you think that innovation is going to be my birthright and i will do everything then you are not letting the opportunities come to you because otherwise you will only have a limited sales force you will have a limited innovation power you will have a limited budget to to experiment on the stuff if you partner with organizations who are specialized in specific fields they will augment they will accelerate your journey much more and then you are able to reach uh, the places where you do not have a where with all in terms of money innovation the appetite as well so i, I think that's the that's the way we should look at it sure thank you thank you uh, for bringing that to light i mean i'm going to jump on to mr balaji shrinivasan who is the executive director of dream folks uh, so mr balaji you know you you built a public organization you know from the journey to, to the point where you started dream folks and to the point where you know it's a it's a public listed company i'm sure that there've been a lot of uh, uh, you know little little journeys in that you have done to build that organization now while aman what he touched upon was the need for partnerships to be built in corporates uh, for you know growth to be happening at pivotal points um, but you know i mean you actually done it in uh, dream folks so particularly um, any any sort of areas that you want to share that were part and were very uh, sort of strategically engineered in the corporate to be able to achieve that growth i think avans kind of absolutely right i think it is important to constantly keep innovating actually if the business model that we started maybe 12 years ago and what we do today i think there is a complete fundamental shift every 2 years 3 years there has to be fundamental reengineering so six sigma process is okay to you know kind of tweak small 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 things but relooking at the business because if you don't you know eat your own business somebody else will come and eat your business so it's better that you know we are the ones who are disrupting ourselves so i think that clarity has been there which is why we probably been so successful uh, today uh, i i would say a lot of pivotal things that have actually happened so one uh, the way we are so our industry is basically giving access to for example services on a credit card for lounges golf etc etc so the industry was run by global companies for almost 30 35 years in the same manner so when we came in we started the first disruption maybe 10 years ago then another disruption after 3 years so constantly there has been disruption and i think uh, anticipating what the demand is actually is really where the thing is so if you see the market the status quo today if you're just giving solutions that takes care of that is going to be very very uh, myopic because some startup will come and you know eat your business so trying to anticipate and so so partnership is important and partnership needs to be both with your partners who are your service partners but more importantly with your clients so we spend a lot of time actually in workshops trying to anticipate what the demand of new products could be for the next 3 years based on that we come and build the product pipeline as to what are the solutions technologies services that needs to be there for them for my customers to be meeting their goals after 3 years so having that kind of approach is what keeps us ahead so i think we are typically 2 3 years ahead of the market and the only reason is because we are doing those workshops to the clients who tell us what they need in 3 years otherwise we would not be able to guess we don't have any magic wand the only source of information to us is the insights that we get when we realize of what is your problem in the pnl which products are not doing well what is the root cause of this what do you think is going to happen there are so many regulatory changes that keep happening where do you think your industry is going to be in so many years so trying to keep everything in mind and trying to build a product framework that takes care of all of that is where i think we've been very successful sure no i think uh, you know you write in probably those workshops and you know helping your teams to elevate themselves um is is how the disruption is going to happen because that fresh thinking and that uh that new ideas is so important but which we sometimes are not able to get in our day to day grind right so uh, so you know um, oh, mr jain is not there right now but uh, maybe you know anybody in the um, um, in the group here would like to add on any sort of strategy that they deployed uh, that was actually helpful to the organization to be able to grow at a certain pivot or a certain pivot that they did which was elementary for that growth to happen so 
okay so i think I, my name is sanjay mishra i am from jindal stainless i think these two gentlemen uh, nicely put the foundation i mean two aspect i want to put here there are two kind of uh, innovation one is uh, technological innovation i think all of us are aware of it and with technology changing every every just too fast i mean somebody was telling me that what is legacy so legacy is something what has been running for 24 hours so if i say technology is changing not in a weeks or months it's hourly basis so one is technology innovation i think what i want to put emphasis is a process innovation in manufacturing it is very important that are we looking to our processes very critically and innovating there culture as so to make sure that we are working on process innovation there are one very critical aspect that is culture piece of it and culture is driven from top down do we have the right culture do we have the right mindset to question the process what we have put 40 years 30 years 20 years which has been working for me for so long why should i look into that so to question that process what we have done and i'm pretty sure many good organizations are doing it we have put a cross functional team of looking into business innovation program and those teams are from supply chain from shop floor from finance from from different plants look into the process critically and suggest some ideas which we should review and then implement it so close to 20 30 teams are there they are putting up top 10 ideas pick up those two ideas and take it to the end so if we deploy technolo technological innovation along with process innovation i am pretty sure that would be the key for us to be a sustainable organization rather than just focusing on technology i mean probably that is these are the two thoughts i wanted to put on the table thank you sure For me, innovation doesn't mean doing new things. It may be uh, doing existing things more efficiently. Like Patanjali uh, started this wellness program three, four years back. It was not very uh, fast going at that time. But during COVID, there was a shift of to the people mindset in health awareness. They were choosing healthy lifestyle. So suddenly this business grew like anything. This is the best performing business of Patanjali Group right now. Mm. Wellness. So it's for me, uh, as rightly touched upon by sir, is that the process is more important than the choosing that this new thing or something else. If we can do existing thing more efficiently, this, this, these practices are uh, for years, thousand years, hundred years, yoga, Ayurveda. But making it user friendly, making it reaching out to the last mile is the more important thing. Using your market more efficiently. Um, I also want to bring one aspect of risk taking. Now, um, as corporates grow, the whole ability of risk taking becomes centered to the top. And sometimes that what those risks are likely to be never get uh, communicated down the line. Um, and therefore, sometimes there is a gap uh, between, you know, the plan that has to be executed and the way the execution takes place. So how do you in organizations close those gaps? You know, you encourage risk taking, but not without uh, taking everybody together. Hi, uh, this is Joe, uh, Joseph Sudhir from uh, Magellanic Cloud. Uh, a very good question on the risk taking. Uh, uh, I've been called uh, as a risk taker uh, <laughs> from the last uh, 10 to 20 years, I would say. Uh, this comes with the ability to uh, to calculate, to analyze uh, before you take the risk. Uh, people say that everybody can take risk or or not, but with the proper calculation and uh, uh, you analyze and you uh, see what the future uh, the countries are needing and the nations are needing. Could be India, it could be anywhere. Uh, the the technological innovations. So some of the risks uh, that we have taken uh, as Magellanic Cloud is uh, getting onto the drones, uh, manufacturing drones area of it. Uh, the need of the hour uh, for the country uh, was there. And uh, the uh, army uh, specifically needs these kind of logistics and the ability the country wants to drive in the agriculture sector as well. So that's when we have taken this challenge and said, uh, put up the plan. And we have uh, the very good founder of it. I mean, it's not just you always taking it. And you should have the right team, ability that comes with that experience that has been all of that. 
So we have spent almost about uh, 50 plus uh, odd crores in getting these logistic drones uh, the way that we are right now. Uh, we can carry up to the close to 100 kg, uh, 80 kg pretty much at the uh, uh, sea level. And at the high altitude levels, we are able to carry about 40 kg payloads uh, for delivering uh, anything to the force uh, from uh, uh, the base camp. Uh, that is very hard to reach uh, for the armies. Uh, it could take about a day uh, or using mules, using other ways of it. So the risk has to be there, but with the calculated, I would say, uh, gives the ability to give that success. Uh, we are about uh, close to getting that success is what I would say. Sure. Okay. If I may add here. Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you for being the only diversity on this table. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had more people, more women represented we on this table. We have actually behind yeah. you. Yep. <laughs> I know, but this table, right? So, it's, but thank you for leading this. Uh, my name is Dallas uh, and I represent a company called Dabalara. We are in the tax technology space and essentially our fundamental job is to minimize risks for our company, for many companies. Now, I just wanted to cover, extend that discussion that Joe mentioned. Uh, there is an inherent risk that companies take when it comes to their own business model. But there are certain aspects of risk which you can actually outsource, right? Uh, Aman is here, fundamentally one of the big businesses advisory, corporate advisory does is that they take that ownership of coming and giving you advisory. So very similarly, uh, tax and death are realities in the market. Nobody can argue around that. So one of the aspects that we have found and when we work with many of the customers, especially SMEs and SMEs here who do businesses globally, is the lack of knowledge or awareness about where the tax is and how the compliances impact them. Right? It's many people imagine that ship it out and that should be good enough. Uh, and US is one of our biggest trade partners, $190 billion worth of exports that go out of India. But US has 13,000 tax jurisdictions, 210, 250,000 tax updates last year. So in order to keep someone updated and manage that risk, there are ability to do that when you, you don't want to do it yourself because that part of the risk you want to give it off to somebody. Right. So that's that's one of the aspects I want to say. There is an element of risk in the business model that you do with your knowledge, with your strength. And there is an element of risk that you look at partners to go and give it to them so that they, they make you better in terms of uh, those risk elements. Right. Sure. So. I want to highlight one point here. The risk of not doing anything. Oh, it's the bigger risk. The, it's the, it's the <laughs> bigger right. risk. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sumit. I represent Metal Power. So we are the manufacturers of capital equipment working with metals and oils. So when we are even talking about risk and, you know, innovations, what I really find is collaboration risks go hand in hand. So what we're doing, we're working with our customers hand in hand, calculating those risks, because when we are working with uh, people like uh, General Steel as well, so they're talking about massive tons of steel, which is making in just one go. So at that point of time, if we goof up, right, so the loss would be so huge, right? So that kind of calculative risk with collaboration with our customers, we're working with lots of uh, automotive steel giants, uh, even uh, not only in India, across the globe, 55 nations. But with these calculative risks, when we talk about, it comes from the collaboration only. We talk to your customers, you speak with them what's their need, how we can address it to them. That's how we are doing it. Sure. In fact, uh, Ritu, I will bring in a perspective of uh, risk. My name is uh, Himanshu Kohli and uh, I'm a part of uh, Client Associates. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, co-founded this company 22 years back. I'll bring uh, an analogy of sports. Now, sports is something which is very close to my heart and cricket is one of the favorites of Indians, Sachin Tendulkar being uh, my role model. And I have observed how he took calculated risk when he was introduced to the international cricket. He used to come fourth down or fifth down, last few overs and he took risk, he started hitting at such a high strike rate and the uh, team was forced to change his position, made him the opening batsman and the uh, rest is history. He made the highest number of centuries in both formats, uh, not both formats now, we are actually a taken over in 
one day. But uh, highest run scorer, he took risk. Similarly, the way I look at my own life, there is no risk, no return, what I think you also mentioned. There is no point leading an ordinary life. So if it's a risk-free life, it's a very ordinary life. Uh, extraordinary pushed me to become an entrepreneur and take a risk. And uh, had I not taken the risk, maybe the innovation of family office would not have taken in India. And uh, today, uh, family office has become a very fashionable term. Uh, trusted advisory has become a very fashionable term. And uh, we say we are an organization which is not two co-founders or entrepreneurs. It's a series of entrepreneurs whom we have co-founded within client associates. And everyone we encourage, give them the capital go and discuss about your plans of growth come out with the business plan and uh, talk about how you want to take the calculated risk to go to the next level and uh, i started my career in early 20s so if 50 years horizon had i gone with a risk free rate of return maybe i would have grown 30x in 50 years what is the power of compounding which we talked about but if i compound at 17 percent i can make it 3000 x and if I compound at 27%, I can make it 3 lakhs x. Now that is what risk and return actually come hand in hand. So while you are taking risk, you need to calculate the risk of it and the returns which you will generate out of it. And continuously the innovation and growth will come because of your ability of taking the risk. So for your first question and second question, without taking risk, you will not be able to innovate and grow also. Right. No, I totally agree with you. In fact, I was going to come to our second point, um, which is now about the governance in uh, from a corporate standpoint. Um, very important. Uh, I mean, you know, as organization grows, uh, whether it is your taxes or whether it is your capital that you need to raise when you need to sort of leaps and bounds grow your organization, uh, that all that all those aspects are going to, you know, at least from a management's point of view, going to take your key time. Uh, and how you will achieve growth over there. So you touched upon the point of family office and, you know, we're going to cover it in this segment here. Um, we'll also talk about tax compliances. You know, uh, we've seen so many good businesses bite dust only for the reason because their taxes and their, you know, debt management was not proper. So how, how do you, how do businesses and corporates actually achieve that right? You know, I mean, this is the last thing that should go wrong. There is, there's so many uh, well-to-do professionals we have in this uh, country. You know, I mean, you cannot go wrong on taxes. You cannot go wrong on capital or a fundraise. A business, if it is good, it is. It should be able to raise capital more easily. So, um, so keeping in this perspective, I'm going to first ask Mr. Vikas Aroda uh, from Shriram Finance. Um, Thanks, Atu. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> No, uh, uh, I'm sure when you when you talked about finance, the first uh, name would have been the BFSI guy on this platform, on this dais. That's me. Thank you, Ritu, for the question. But uh, just to add, before we jump onto this, you know, I, I've been hearing a lot of interesting perspectives and, uh, you know, uh, ideas and thoughts around a lot of uh, processes about people, about the culture, which a lot of our people said, about the risk tolerance, uh, risk uh, in, in the organization. Just want to add a small bit out there. I feel every organization should be it entrepreneur like my friend Himanshu over there or large setups like JSPL, uh, sorry, Jindal uh, Group and uh, PW who are there. What we need to convey very strongly to our teams when you work in a large setup, the risk tolerance band, mm. the communication and the culture should always encourage risk. But where we really fall flat is we are unable to communicate what should be the area of that band tolerance band you should operate in. Because what happens is sometimes we say, okay, we are we are an entrepreneur organization. We want to promote a lot of people who want to take risk. But to what extent are we reviewing them? Are we encouraging them? Are we directing them? Are we evaluating them? That's where we miss the continuous engagement and communication. That leads to another point. Communication is very important. Sometimes, so uh, in my, when I started my career as a core banker and then I went on to head a tech company and now I'm setting up a digital lending business here. I, I had three pivots in my career itself. Mm -hmm. I had taken enough risk in my, in my career also. 
uh, not obviously like the entrepreneurs on the dais who have done much more it's always what i tell my teams take risk but know the downside and be, uh, act in that band and you are free to do now coming back to the question the corporate uh, you know able to raise capital i think any organization and when i meet lot of corporate clients when i meet lot of corporates uh, the promoters the ceos the cfos i always ask them what is don't the projection of a business is good to have good to look great but what is the purpose of the organization where are you heading what is your growth plans where are you intending to grow how many not just how many top line you would add but how many people you're going to add how many uh, you know uh, what is the scale of the entire organization you're looking at and when you are clear as a corporate what is your long term horizon then rest of the things just fall in place equity debt See, today world is very transparent world is full of opportunities today you go to a smallest town you know there are some small bank some small finance bank or some large psu having a branch or we we are now more than 3100 or branches we are there we are there to in fact shriram was started is a 50 year old institution started with only catering to self employed we have lent money to the last person in the entire value chain right so capital availability is not a question now with rise of fintechs light of technologies data interpretation is also not, not a problem data availability is also not a problem the problem is the clarity of the borrower the clarity clarity of the company clarity of the individual what is their purpose why are what is going to they do with this money you know i i, I wrote a few days back something on greed which is coming in people you know now people want there were days where people were happy with 8 10% return now people want to take multipliers and it's not just individual corporates also talking that language right good to have that conversation great to have those conversation but is it you are creating a sustainable business opportunity is it going to sustain or just looking for one year so when you look at taking such decisions in your professional or personal life look at at least 10 years 5 years how are you going to achieve that growth in a sustainable and a consistent way and capital raise is the easiest thing at least in today's time 10 15 years back it was a difficult but now i think it's the most commoditized capital uh, commodity available uh, to any corporate individual ritu can i come in here yeah um, yeah please i'm yashraj from captain biz and i want to weigh in here because what we are really trying to do is solve taxation and gst at the lowest grassroots level in india so as captain biz what we realize is that india has 64 million msmes and these msmes are facing issues of not having access to funds they get gst notices they get tax notices the moment they get a tax notice they probably have to shut down their business they don't know they'll open their doors the next day and compliance is a massive issue for this entire group of people and india has the highest number of msmes in the world and while the government launches programs and they say that we will do this and we will do that ultimately it never translates into them getting it because all of these msmes a large number of them who operate in the 50 lakh turnover to the 5 crore turnover they still do business with pen and paper and we are trying to change that so we are trying to say that okay can we digitize these msmes so initially when we started off we said okay you know we'll give you gst we'll give you compliance aapko notice nahi aayega we'll basically make sure that all these things happen and what we realized is all of these msmes would start shivering the moment you tell them gst because they think that gst has been made to kill us so we said okay gst chhod do what we will do is we will help you raise the digital bills and we will help you digitize your businesses what that did is that they were able to raise their sales invoices their purchase invoices they had formal records they were able to take those records to the banks to the nbfcs get loans get working capital and then they just got used to this process so much more and then they realized that this is the way i can manage the business this is the way i can innovate and honestly these are the people who are real risk takers because they move from pen and paper in a traditional way of doing business they said that we are going to digitize people who ever actually never ever used digital in their business they started digitizing so we think this is 
at, I mean, at the corporate level, obviously you have resources, you have money, you have equipment to do all of these things. But at the grassroots level is where I think the real India lies because they contribute 30% of India's GDP. And we think that, you know, this is the way to kind of start managing taxes at, uh, at grassroots India with capital business. And that's what we're doing. Sure. Uh, Mr. Balaji, how, how did, you know, you make sure that at Dream folks prior to the going public, all compliances were in place. In fact, you know, why wait for uh, going public to put compliances in place? If compliance should anyway be there. Uh, good governance is a hallmark of a good business. So, you know, how, how do you sort of as a corporate make sure that, you know, enough diligence is being put in that area so that, you know, even if you have to raise capital, let alone an IPO, but even if you just have to raise capital at some point of time to meet some project expansion, that capital should be easy to find if you know you're compliant, your books are right, your um, you know your essentially your organization is structured rightly. What is your opinion on this? Yeah, I don't think compliance should be an afterthought. I think if the tenets of compliance are known, and there are many different comes. We are only talking about tax compliance. There is data compliance. So in our business, that is maybe even more paramount. So data, information security, these are very, very non-negotiables because if something happens and the business kind of directly shuts down. Right. So that is the level of, there is no notice, right? So for us, we are very clear on what we needed to do. Uh, I think the burden of compliance increased when we went public. So that was a big change for us when we were a private company, it was okay, we knew what we were doing. But then a lot of new learning, we had to uh, you know, staff our entire team just to kind of ensure that we knew what the compliances were to be done and quite a few it was uncharted territories for us so a lot of learning but i think we were guided very well so we took the even before we went public maybe uh, a year ago we started uh, understanding all the nuances of compliance on the taxation and other public company compliances information security very very important for us so that we have been ahead so i think we have around the few pci dss4 companies uh, which we are ahead, maybe a year ahead of the mandate we got certified. So I think being compliant is not an option. I think if that clarity is there with your leadership and as well as your teams, then everything starts to follow. You start questioning everything. Are the contracts proper? Are uh, will, will a lawyer agree to this? So I think a lot of that scrutiny that needs to happen, maybe post facto, you are able to do yourself because you start thinking in that manner. Right. So it's really the way how you think and how then therefore how your team thinks. So if everybody is thinking compliance first in that there cannot be any violation, this is non-negotiable, then the organization also understands that this is non-negotiable. These things get, you know, uh, killed right at the very beginning. Right. Of course, there are nuances like tax compliance all for which we do need an expert. And then that's where the experts come in. Sure. I will add, add something here. Sure, please. So it's basically uh, like MSME's, ka, you know, an example here. Till the time they will see compliance as a cost to the business it will be there, the risk will be there. They have to treat it as a part of the business. The compliance mostly is the part of the business. I read yesterday some, uh, somewhere, so it's difficult to look stupid when things are going ba uh, bad. <laughs> Intelligent, when things are going bad, and difficult to look stupid when things are going good. So most of the promoters, when things are going good, they tend to ignore too many things. Too many things, they have to experience some notices, some bad things, then they will start appreciating the, the cost of compliance. So that's why in India, we need to educate that the compliance is the part of the business rather than the cost of the business. Yeah. I just want to come in here as well. So on compliance, what we realized is that, um, you know, it's kind of difficult uh, because it's not always clear what compliance required, especially when you're innovating. Right. So when you're innovating, you're doing different things. And so before Captain Biz, I set up Dream 11. Uh, and we had the biggest challenge because we didn't know what we were doing was right or wrong. So we started off with service tax, we went on to GST, and now you know what's happening. The government is saying at highest percent, 28% GST is what we're going to call, which is the highest slab. And then they're basically backtracking all of that. So you see, this is, I mean, it's while you, as much as you want to do, um, there's always, there'll always be something that you're missing. And I think that is, that is what, uh, you know, you need help for from people like these. You wanted to add something, Dallas? Yep, similar space, um, I think, uh, to what you do, um, in the sense that we solve for US sales tax and US, use tax compliances. And for people here who 
especially digital services, digital product companies who export into the US, uh, many of the times you don't realize the level of complexity uh, that you have here. Quite honestly, uh, I've been here now nine months and I, and I am sometimes thinking, really, uh, US is giving a ease of doing business ranking on taxes for India. Wait till you see what uh, US sales taxes and compliances are, right? As I said, 13,000 tax jurisdictions and real complexity is extremely high. Now, one of the challenges that we find, especially with smaller firms, right, many of them, they can't really afford a PwC, right? When, because it's really expensive, an SME and mid-market space. And to Balaji's point, compliance is really not an option. It's day zero job, right? Be it uh, taxes, governance. IT security, these are all day zero jobs for any company. If you were really in it for, if you want to build a company that is multi-generational, you'll have to start thinking that as a core value of being compliant, right? Then your cons, whether it is a pre-IPO scenario, post-IPO scenario, raising funds, all of those are de rigueur because you're all, you always operate uh, on the right side of how you want to be there. No, so that the other aspect that's coming around as a result of cost of compliance, there is a cost of non-compliance, there is a cost of compliance, now, right? So people take, tend to take risk on non-compliance because the cost of compliance becomes very expensive. The ability to afford a very expensive CPA if you're exporting into the US is not something that many people would like to do. And that's where technology is coming in as a huge lever in the context of automation, right? So there are many tax technology firms that come in. I know PwC has built their own frameworks and models that allows for speed, uh, which, and which reduces the cost, that allows for accuracy, which reduces risk. So when you try to bring in, tech, you know, the, with the ability to bring more technology in the tax and compliance space with the domain and expertise, you actually can make it simpler and easier. Right. So that's that's a big part of, uh, you know, when you set up a business and when you grow a business, when you scale a business, you would want to keep that as a day zero job and look at options where you see a cost of compliance is also an area because your non cost of non-compliance is always 10 times more than cost of compliance. So you have to take that as a day zero job. Right? So. Sure. Um, coming to you, Himanshu, you know, um, he just touched on, just touched upon multi-generational businesses and today multi-generational businesses are really not about, you know, repeating the same thing over and over again. So it's not about, you know, if somebody started producing textiles at some point of time for the next 1000 years, they'll only be producing textiles. So they'll obviously be delving into various other areas. And, you know, wealth has become and wealth management and uh, wealth expansion has become a very important aspect of a corporate today it's a it it was probably you know 20 years back i would have told you that it's you know it's one fancy vertical that you might want to build in a corporate but today it's a very elemental part of any corporate and how they want to expand it so when it comes to family offices what are your opinion in terms of how corporates should approach it you know over the years now i think family offices in india are almost getting to be a decade old so what best practices have come out for family offices? Should they be managed uh, by the gen next or should they be managed by a team of professionals? You know, what are the, what is the good way to do wealth management for a family office, uh, investing in startups, investing in, uh, you know, other assets? How does it work best? So I would say family offices is, uh, uh, we launched 22 years back. Uh, we launched 22 years back. That time we had to go and explain the whole concept of family offices. Most of the people used to listen to us. 90% never used to understand it. And uh, as a result, business kept on getting delayed. Uh, while this concept, if you see Rockefeller in US brought in about 170, 180 years back, uh, they were a billion dollar family. And they said, everyone is coming and selling us something or the other because they know we have some wealth. But we need to set up our own processes, our own systems, and maybe one member from the family needs to be working on this away from the operations. Uh, and they set up the first single family office in the US. In fact, when we studied more about it, we realized this is a concept which is thousand year old. Uh, Raja Maharaja used to have their mantri, uh, sutradhars, Munshi or uh, whatever term. So we basically professionalized that concept in the Indian market. 
more catering to the Indian requirements. That is something which has happened. And today I would say, Ritu, it has become a very fashionable term. Everyone says we are running a family office. Uh, whether they have uh, 10 crores of wealth or 100 crores of wealth or 1000 crores of wealth or 1 lakh crores of wealth, it has become a fashionable term and they want to be related to this fashionable term. But yes, it is growing at a very rapid pace. Clearly because if Indian population is growing at let's say 1.5% per annum, HNI population is growing at 16% per annum. Every few minutes, like if we do this conference for 60 minutes, maybe there are 30 millionaires who are born in the society today. Uh, every day, there are three ultra high net worth, uh, $30 million, they are born over here. And every month there is a billion dollar story which is getting created. So yeah. 20 years back, maybe five to 10 years, you used to hear a $1 billion story. These days, every month you hear a billion dollar story. So if wealth is growing, all these concepts around wealth management, family offices are going to grow uh, multifold over here. Mm -hmm. So today, the whole thing is people are saying, I want to detach from my traditional business. My business is separate and my personal wealth is separate. Maybe from my personal wealth, I look at business as one asset class. And uh, earlier school of thought used to be, one business used to go to the second, third, fourth, one used to start it, second used to grow it, third used to enjoy it, and fourth used to destroy it. That is how it used to happen. Today, an entrepreneur wants to create three or four businesses during their lifetime. And uh, they want to be serial entrepreneurs. They are less uh, attached to the emotions of the business. They are more pragmatic about value creation. That is something which is happening. And uh, when people are setting up their family offices, they are distancing themselves from the businesses. They are getting the professional management to run the businesses. And they are saying we are asset allocators. They are bringing in the best of board over there, even the governance system in their family offices. So this is something which is a huge shift which is happening. And uh, I can give an example of my classmate from Shiram College. Two of us started our journey together. The other day I bumped into him and he says, I'm coming out with a 600 crores IPO. Uh, and his family never thought about paying taxes 20 years back because they thought taxes to wastage hai. But then when he separated from his family, he started from day one that I have to pay taxes, I have to f put full governance, I have to create a board. In fact, governance uh, or compliance, actually there's a premium which comes. So now he's coming out with an IPO and he says 600 crores IPO, my bi biggest asset is this, other than my farmhouse where I stay. 300 crores, I want to take it out and set up a family office. Maybe you decide the allocation, how it needs to go into uh, new age businesses, how much it needs to go into the uh, equity markets or bonds. I need some regular income or maybe I need to diversify beyond India. So typically, if you ask me, anyone who has 100 crores plus kind of a liquid wealth can go to a multifamily office. Anyone who has a thousand crores kind of a wealth can do a combination of an outsourced and internal. Anyone who has more than 10,000 crores of liquid wealth can set up a single family office. And uh, depending on also whether they want to be multi-asset classes, multi-businesses, uh, but if they just want to keep their money in government of India bonds, even if it, they have one lakh crore of wealth, they don't need a family office. They can just do with their own munshi or they can also do it with their own uh, banker who can actually provide those bonds to them. I wonder if the Munshi actually still exists. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, is Shruti here uh, in the hall? I don't see her. I don't know. Her name is written in her. Is Shruti here? Shruti Gat? She here? Okay, um, so you know, I've also been given a green signal in terms of the session timing coming to a close. We're happy to take some questions from the house. So, you know, if there is some questions, please uh, show of hand and you can just put the question on to the uh, expert panel out here. Anybody? I'm Raghavind from DBS Bank. I'm in a corporate banking division uh, handling a clientele up to 600 crores. Basically, my focus is on mid corporate and SMEs. Uh, just one question. So when I generally uh, deal with SMEs and mid corporates, we recently had a discussion and everybody talked about partnerships, risk, 
financing, utilization of the uh, cost, you know, optimization of the resources. But one thing that I really uh, am shocked to see when I meet clients is that they don't have awareness about the utilization of the funds, the correct sourcing of the funds, and the, the uses of all the uh, resources, be it a tangible or a non-tangible, uh, the output that they generate. So uh, how can we as an industry uh, build upon the awareness so that everybody within that particular industry can benefit out of this? It's not only just for an intra-industry uh, collaboration or an awareness, but how can inter-industry collaboration help in this, especially as far as the banks are concerned? Thank you. Who wants to take it up? Okay. So see, SMEs are mostly uneducated about the finances. So uh, as a banker, uh, 13 years at SBI, uh, I learned from SMEs that ki unko ye bhi batana kafi muskil ho jata hai ki capital ka ek value hai. So they normally tend to avoid the taxes, but that, that and the interest stops from them the look of to it. creating a capital. Or that stops them to creating expanding somewhere because at that time banks will ask for their margin money they don't have. so it's all about you know do char sal paan sal unko bank se jab questions aate hain tab unko realize hota hai ki haan taxes dena chahiye so uh, you asked about the smes who are banking ask about those smes who are not even banking unke paas to kuch bhi nahi koi rule nahi follow karte ho so it's a growing mindset industry time now people are coming with sme ipos now coming people are uh, experiencing this capital uh, market so then the compliance ka jo unko benefit aata hai wo realize kar rahe hain initially uh, in my times at least 10 years back it was very hard for them to understand them that ki rating jo bank nikalti hai jiske karan unka interest cost badh jata hai so unko ye bhi samjhana kafi mushkil hota tha ki aap apna uh, tnw ya do char ratio jo hum log dekhte hain wo agar acha rakhe to aapka cost of cap, uh, borrowing bhi ghatta hai again एक चीज और उनको समझाना काफी मुश्किल हो जाता है कि तेरे जो टैक्स एडजस्टेड कॉस्ट ऑफ बोरोइंग एंड टैक्स एडजस्टेड कॉस्ट ऑफ कैपिटल सो दीज आर थिंग्स व्हिच दे अंडरस्टैंड मच लेटर इन इन द बिगिनिंग ऑफ देयर जर्नी एज ए एंटरप्रेन्योर वी एज अ बैंकर हैव टू एजुकेट देम आई एड ऑन टू दिस सो वी हैव एज ऑन इंडिया और एंटरप्राइजेस ग्रोन इन अ कल्चर व्हिच इज ऑब्सेस्ड विद बॉटम लाइन बट इफ इफ यू लुक एट फ्रॉम अ सर्वाइवल ग्रोथ and even the profitability standpoint cash flow is something that the businesses should definitely look at mm. there is not much awareness about how do you use your cash flow and how do you leverage your internal organization assets whether it is inventory whether it is suppliers whether it is your customers how do you look at your capital allocation because what ends up happening is that you are very obsessive growth about uh, growth focused you are also focused about profitability but you do not know are you doing the right contracts do you, are you moving your inventory right are your contracts processes are in alignment or not your business has enough ways of making your business stand up on your feet and only then you should look at outside obviously there is a merit to both but those are things that need to be done and it is not just industry it is at the academia level also which is important that you read in your colleges you know your ca what is cash flow but if you ask anybody on the street what is the definition of free cash flow what is net working capital what is working capital what is the difference between the two what is weighted average cost of capital 80% of the people guaranteed will not know this mm. totally small point here. just a small point here i think we need to acknowledge one fact we used the businesses were run by typically lalas you know and lala used to define decide how the cash flow for today should look like right how much money he would his munshi used to have a piece, piece of paper would figure out how much money coming in coming out and when you become big you suddenly from a lala you become a organization you know you start building those thought processes we are we are actually on a cusp of a shift a marky shift you know i'm seeing those smaller companies and with the rise of msme ipo market with the rise of lot of entrepreneurs who live by you know everyday cash flow we, we speak to so many startups for them cash flow is the only important thing they don't do not know you know i was recently attending this global fintech fest last week and i met a startup which had a booth and i asked him how much you're burning he said i have just run away for one month now what are you doing here why are you spending on a you know lakhs of rupees on a booth he said i'm so confident that out of this i'll get a client and i'm sure by the end of the month i would have more money to run by 
you can question his uh, intelligence or you can really you know give him kudos for his uh, you know aggression but the fact that the world is changing india is changing and people are much more aware how the cash flow look like and the mindset gradually from a lala mindset to organizational mindset is about to happen it's just that i've never seen the the term munshi on a linkedin profile so it sort of <laughs> gives me an awe as to where where do they exist now in today's world um you know i've been given a hard stop now uh, in terms of this i would have loved to continue this discussion it's actually very riveting um, but thank you very much all for joining it's it's been a pleasure talking to all of you and if you have some questions our speakers will be here for a little while so if you can uh, you know meet up and uh, exchange cards and probably have a conversation thank you very much for joining us here today morning